Our course objectives today are to define the difference between innocent and injured spouse relief. Uh, this is a very commonly, um, very commonly uh, uh, messed up thing, even amongst practitioners. Um, understanding the difference between um, uh, between the two, uh, you know, for practitioners, it's it's it can be difficult. Uh, we're also going to look at the injured spouse procedures. Uh, we'll look at various innocent spouse provisions and rules, including some things that you don't commonly hear about. Uh, we'll go in depth on form 8857. And then uh, finally, we'll discuss appeals procedures for innocent spouse relief. So what is the difference between innocent and injured spouse relief? So like I said earlier, this is very commonly confused. So injured spouse, this is when one spouse is quote unquote injured by federal offsets of the other spouse's sole liability. Remember if they're filing married filing jointly uh, on their 1040, then they are jointly liable um, for and jointly and separately liable for the tax obligation. However, there are cases where one spouse has a debt that can be satisfied through the federal offset program. The most common situations where this occurs are unpaid child support, debts to various federal or state agencies, uh, and separate tax liabilities. For example, if one spouse has a tax liability that was incurred prior to the marriage, or if a one spouse owns uh, uh, a business and there was an employment tax situation that generated a trust fund recovery penalty. Trust fund recovery penalties uh, are only against one person. It is not a joint liability. So if a, a, let's say one spouse owns a trust fund recovery penalty and uh, they file a joint return and they get a refund or they're due a refund. Well, because one spouse owes a trust fund recovery penalty, the IRS is going to seize that entire refund. Now, if the other spouse would have otherwise been due a part of that refund based on their own income, then th that is an injured spouse situation because their part of the refund was seized to satisfy the other spouse's trust fund recovery penalty. Okay, This is where injured spouse comes in. So uh, uh, under Internal Revenue Code Section 6402, that's the federal offset program, uh, the injured spouse program provides relief from those offsets. Okay. So that's injured spouse. And the way that I, that I, I used to remember this is that they're injured in, in terms of their money was taken when they never had an obligation to pay whatever the, the other spouse uh, was being uh, offset for. Okay. So they were financially injured by the seizure of the refund. Okay, that's that's how I remember it. Now let's take a look at innocent spouse. When when a married couple files a 1040 filing jointly, that obviously creates a joint liability. It is a joint and separate liability. So each spouse is individually liable for the entire uh, liability, and they're also jointly liable for the full thing. Okay. The uh, Internal Revenue Code uh, specifically states that each spouse is wholly responsible for the accuracy of the return as well. They are also responsible for penalties and interest. So tax penalties and interest um, are the responsibility of both for the entire dollar amount. Now, um, innocent spouse relief has existed in the code for quite some time. 
However, the Raw Rock 98, the uh, uh, IRS Restructuring and Reauthorization Act of 1998, it expanded relief and created three distinct categories that we'll talk about later. Uh, IRC 6015 didn't exist prior to the Raw Raw of 98. So the whole purpose of innocent spouse relief, which by the way is a, is a more difficult process than injured spouse relief. Injured spouse relief is pretty straightforward uh, because there was a tax liability or, or, a, or a child support obligation or a state liability, something out there that was the responsibility of one spouse that was clearly not the responsibility of the injured spouse, okay? Um, they're pretty clear cut. Innocent spouse, on the other hand, um, is a lot more difficult. Uh, it's a much lengthier process. It's a much lengthier form. And the, the, the reason for that is because under the law, each spouse is jointly responsible, okay? It, it, they're equally responsible for the entire tax liability of uh, the, the marital unit, okay? So we are asking the government to create a separation of that joint liability. Now, remember, if from a, a, a business perspective, a, a collections perspective, doing this is not generally in the best interest of the government. So look at it from their angle. Um, this is something that they don't want to do, all right? However... Congress recognized the fact that there are um, many legitimate situations where uh, they need to be um, a little bit more um, lenient on this. So that is why uh, these provisions were added in Internal Revenue Code Section 6015. In order to apply for either program, uh, like everything, there is a form. So uh, for innocent spouse relief, you'll file form 8857. And for injured spouse relief, you'll file form 8379, uh, which is basically nothing more than an allocation worksheet divvying up the income and the withholding and payments uh, that were turned over to the government uh, so that you could get an allocation of how much of the, the refund would have been um, uh, allocated to the injured spouse. Okay, it's a pretty straightforward uh, process. So um, the uh, other thing to keep in mind here, and this is kind of a practice management thing for you, uh, if you have an active uh, form 2848 power of attorney for uh, a client in this situation, you can complete and sign uh, either of these forms. Uh, the taxpayer does not need to sign these if you have uh, an active power of attorney, okay? So let's talk about injured spouse procedures. Now remember, injured spouse is when a federal offset of a refund or overpayment is applied to the uh, some sort of a liability uh, of one spouse that's not owed by the other. So uh, this requires that we talk a little bit about the federal offset program. Injured spouse claims arise directly as a result of federal offsets. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with the offset program, uh, offsets are nothing more than interceptions of refunds, uh, overpayments, or payments. Uh, what I didn't put on this slide was that offsets can also be um, in the form of Social Security, okay? Um, up to 15% of uh, Social Security payments can be subject to the federal offset program. Uh, in the same way that refunds or overpayments are. Um, if you are a government contractor, your payments under that government contract can be subject to the federal offset program. So uh, if you have a uh, an individual consulting contract with some federal agency, okay, the and you owe a federal tax debt, a child support obligation, well, the treasury 
can take payments that they would otherwise send to you under your, your federal contract and apply those to these other obligations. So uh, overpayments are first applied to federal tax debts. Um, and this is all federal tax debts. Um, and even within this, there is a priority order. Uh, for example, trust fund uh, obligations go first. Uh, uh, so if you have a refund or a federal payment of any sort that's coming to you and you owe an obligation, uh, federal tax debts take top priority. Um, after that, you have unpaid child support. That is the second priority um, in the allocation after federal tax debts. Uh, and then the rest of these are not in um, priority order. Uh, but if you, for example, received an excessive unemployment compensation amount, uh, then that can be paid back to the government through the federal offset program. And then, of course, state tax debts and then tr other treasury offset program obligations. So uh, this is where the entire problem about injured spouse originates. So some, some procedural things for you to keep in mind. Number one, it's really best to contact the IRS before an offset occurs. I don't, I, you, know, you know, I've been doing this for seven years and I have never had an injured spouse situation where the, they didn't know about it, okay? Um, if, if there is an unpaid child support obligation, if there's a federal tax debt, um, they know about it, okay? There are notices that are sent. There um, are probably court proceedings, you know, that, that uh, came about. You know, um, I, I've never seen a situation where it wasn't already known. So the thing to keep in mind here is that you can uh, file for the injured spouse allocation with the 1040 return, okay? So if, if there is a chance that there's gonna be a federal offset, um, the, the unit of the Treasury Department that handles this is the Bureau of Fiscal Sur Service. They're gonna send a warning letter saying, hey, you owe child support. We're gonna take your tax refund. Okay, that warning letter comes with a copy of Form 8379 and its instructions. Okay, so the best way to avoid uh, a, a, a problem down the road is simply to include the Form 8379 with the return. And then if there is an ongoing obligation, like, you know, if there's a, a large trust fund recovery penalty, for example, um, is where I've more commonly seen this with, with what I do. Um, the, the simple thing to do um, is to indicate injured spouse on any new 1040 return. Put it as a, put it as a, a, a comment in an e-file. Uh, if you're filing a paper return, you know, put it, just write it across the top of the return, injured spouse, okay? Um, so that it is flagged in the system. If you e-file a return with the 8379 attached, it will accomplish the same thing. Um, and it will help to prevent um, the federal offset or, a, or the portion of the federal offset um, that should be attributable to um, uh, uh, allocated to the injured spouse. Uh, according to uh, the Internal Revenue Manual, uh, the processing time for a return with an 8379 attached is approximately 11 to 14 weeks. Uh, it, now, if you're not filing the injured spouse request with the return, but rather after a refund has already been seized, then file um, film, that should say file, file form 8379, uh, and the IRM says to wait 45 days. In my experience, uh, that 45 days is pretty conservative. Um, after 45 days, call, call, call again. They're going to tell you to wait some more. Um, the customer service representative um, 
training manual, you know, the, the section of the IRM that um, the customer service reps at the IRS use to do their job, um, they are told to tell you to wait 30 more days. Okay, that's what they're told to tell you in their manual. Uh, normally, uh, I, I see, um, uh, you know, eight weeks is about right. Okay. Um, so 60 days is, is probably going to be a more, um, realistic processing time. Now also, um, uh, like I said, if you can e-file the 8379 with the 1040, that really is the best way, uh, to do it. Um, and, and yes, as Catherine pointed out in chat, yeah, you can totally do that now. Um, it's, uh, 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 I, the, the, what, three or four tax prep softwares that I've, uh, um, tested out last year, um, before, before, uh, choosing one, um, all of them that I looked at included the 8379, none of the commercial pr tax prep softwares that I, I tried out did not have it. So they all should have the ability to file e-file the return, um, uh, e-file the 8379 with the return. Okay. Um, Howard, do note, if you don't file the 8379 with the return or a refund occurs because they quote unquote didn't know about the problem, uh, and it comes up later and you're on the phone with the IRS, um, the customer service representative may tell you, oh, you need to mail in the form, uh, separately. Okay. Um, and that's bogus information you can fax the 8379 directly to the customer service representative, okay? Um, and if you have a power of attorney, you can sign it, all right? So you fax the customer service representative uh, a copy of your 2848 and the completed 8379. Those are processable, all right? Do not let a customer service representative at the IRS tell you that it's non-processable. It specifically states in the IRM that they have to accept um, accept those faxed uh, 8379s, okay? This one tip alone can save you a ton of time. Um, so if nothing else out of this slide, I hope that you get, um, that you can fax them in when you're on the phone with the customer service rep, uh, and you can e-file the 8379 along with the 1040, okay? Those two things will save you a lot of time uh, when you're working with clients. So now let's talk about innocent spouse relief, okay? This is the much bigger topic than the injured spouse relief. And keep in mind, the, the Internal Revenue Code did contain uh, some uh, innocent spouse provisions prior to the raw raw of 98, okay? The thing that raw raw did is that it uh, it streamlined the process first of all? Um, it it made things a lot clearer, okay. And by adding Internal Revenue Code Section sixty fifteen, it gave us three different uh, avenues that we can take uh, for obtaining innocent spouse relief. So. Um, Section, so paragraph B of, of section 6015 provides for relief from deficiency. So this is the, the, the general, broader, um, you know, historically as we know it, version of innocent spouse relief. But it also created uh, 6015 paragraph C, which is the separation of the liability. So being able to actually uh, separate the liability post-assessment, okay, that's important, post-assessment um, is, is, is important. We'll talk about that uh, uh, more. Um, the, the separation of the liability under 6015C um, is particularly of interest in community property states. Um, uh, and, and as was mentioned over in chat, yes, the IRS does have to apply, uh, state community property laws to innocent spouse relief situations. Um, 
And when I was putting this presentation together, uh, I, I debated getting into the community property stuff. But the, the, the reality is we could spend an hour just talking about that. It's a very uh, in-depth and involved subject. So um, that's something I'll do in a future presentation. Um, but uh, keep in mind that uh, it, it is a factor. And this uh, separation of liability provision uh, comes into play in these community property situations. Uh, and then section F of 6015 uh, provides what's called equitable relief. This is the, um, the, um, uh, it, this is the uh, effective tax administration equivalent from the offer and compromise world to the innocent spouse relief uh, world. Um, equitable relief allows the IRS uh, discretionary granting of relief um, after collections activity has already taken place. So um, you could look at it in kind of a way as almost an injured spouse um, sub-provision under innocent spouse relief um, because equitable relief provides um, for refunds after collection. And then uh, you'll see here, I did put in the brief uh, thing about the community property states. Um, married taxpayers in community property states that file separately may still be liable for a spouse's tax debt under state law, okay? Um, so if, if you live in one of the community property states, um, it behooves you very, very much to uh, understand your state laws uh, in regards to married filing separately situations, not just married filing jointly situations. Um, and a lot of uh, uh, tax professionals I talk to in community property states um, don't, you know, they're, they're very familiar with the married filing jointly uh, provisions, um, but they, uh, some of them are not aware of this uh, married filing separately provision. Um, so be sure you take that into consideration if you live in a community property state and be sure to research that. So there are time limits for filing for innocent spouse relief. If you are filing under uh, uh, the, 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 the more standard provisions, um, not the equitable relief provision, you must file your request within two years of whatever collection activity you are requesting relief from. So where this is really going to come into play for a, a, you know, a practical scenario, the, 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 the IRS is going to send out its normal, notice cycle, right? On a, on a, on a tax obligation on a, uh, a tax return. So that is the start of the collection activity. Uh, so when you get that first, you know, 21 day letter, uh, that starts the IRS collections cycle. And, uh, you know, if, if you filed the return, that is being collected upon, then hopefully your client will come to you with that letter saying, hey, look, you know, they're coming after us for the money and they're, they're telling us, you know, it's, we both have to pay it. Um, so if they can't pay the obligation and there is going to be an innocent spouse situation, then you, as a practitioner, uh, it, it behooves us, um, and it's just good customer service, for us to be really on the ball in terms of saying, you know, uh, hey, you know, we need to get on this innocent spouse thing now. So uh, keep that in mind that there is a time limit on this. For the equitable uh, relief provisions, this is after, you know, money has already been paid over, refunds have already been uh, offset, uh, uh, you know, payments have already been made, the debt's already been paid off even. Um, if you're requesting innocent spouse relief under equitable relief, which is provision F, 
This is a, a different time period, okay? The RSED, uh, the, the refund statute expiration date, um, and the CSED, the collection statute expiration date. The innocent spouse relief must be applied for within either of those two periods, okay? So if you're requesting a, uh, you know, if you're basically, remember, uh, Section F, it's a claim for refund is what it is, okay? So your, your two-year limitation on uh, a claim for refund, that's the R said, it applies in innocent spouse situations, right? Um, and then also a note, if you are applying for relief under, um, under the allocation section, which is 6015C, uh, no refunds are allowed uh, when you're using that allocation election. Uh, a question in chat, what was the 21-day letter? Uh, the 21-day letter, also called the SNOD, uh, for short, the Statutory Notice of Deficiency. Uh, this is the, it's, it's the initial bill that they send you, okay? Um, it is not the lien notice. Uh, the 668Y, the, the notice of federal tax lien, uh, will come, uh, you know, several, you know, a couple months later. Um, but the 21 day letter uh, is the, you know, is the, the, here's your bill, demand for payment. And the reason it's called a 21 day letter is that um, in the vast majority of situations, uh, the, the, the service the, the, will grant you a 21 day leniency period. Uh, to pay the obligation um, uh, in order to avoid uh, penalties and interest, additional, pen uh, 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 additional penalties and interest uh, on that. Um, so if you can pay it within the 21-day period, then the taxpayer saves some, some money. Okay, So that's why it's called the 21-day letter. Let's talk about collections action. Uh, in regards to innocent spouse cases. Uh, once you file for innocent spouse relief, um, the, the IRS is, is barred from taking their normal collections action. Okay? Um, this means they can't levy. This means that um, they, they can't initiate seizure proceedings. Um, you know, all the normal things that the collections division does is halted uh, during the review period um, uh, with some exceptions, okay? Um, there is a form, Form 870-I, uh, which is the Waiver of Collections Restriction in Innocent Spouse Cases. Um, in my seven years of doing collections representation, I have never, ever, 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 ever um, allowed a client to, fi to, to sign Form 870. Um, um, uh, it's, 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 I've, I've, I've never seen it. I've never seen it be necessary. Um, I, could, I, I can envision situations where it could be uh, a negotiating tool, um, which is what we commonly do um, over on the trust fund recovery penalty side. It's, it's very common um, uh, to, to sign a waiver of um, the three-year assessment statute uh, limitation uh, for, for assessment of the, the trust fund recovery penalty um, in order to get a, um, an in-business trust fund installment agreement. Um, but for a 1040 case, I mean, there's, there's nothing that I've ever seen that's, that's sufficient to, to warrant this. Okay? So be very, very cautious in allowing your clients to sign this. Um, collections action is also uh, barred during the uh, statutory 90-day uh, tax court petition period, okay? Um, uh, so there are uh, various situations that incur um, this 90-day review period where you can file a tax court pe petition. Um, after that 90 days expires, then, like, for example, on the, uh, the denial of innocent spouse relief, um, there is a tax court petition period. Um, after that expires, then collections action can resume. Um, if there is a, a docketed tax court case, um, then collections action 
is barred until after the judge declares, um, you know, makes a final decision, declares the, 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 the tax court case closed after immediately after that collections action can continue. Now, as a point of IRS policy and procedure um, and not law, um, these, these bars against collection action, these are statutory, okay? Um, but as a matter of uh, procedure, the IRS will not pursue collections after a tax court appeal is filed unless the CSED is coming or it is a jeopardy situation. Okay, and, and talking about Jeopardy situations is beyond the scope of, of today's presentation. Um, but if, if a revenue officer uh, or group manager determines that um, it is a Jeopardy collection situation um, after a tax court decision is finalized, um, but the taxpayer has already notified the service that they're going to appeal, uh, the revenue officer will pursue collections action in jeopardy situations or if a CSET is fast approaching. Um, but except for those two situations, as a matter of procedure, um, uh, the IRM instructs ROs not to pursue collection um, uh, after a tax court decision if the taxpayer has notified them they're going to file an appeal. Okay. So... Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that during the uh, day for day, during the entire period of an innocent spouse review process, um, plus an additional 60 days, the collection statute expiration date is extended day for day during that review period um, uh, until the review is closed. All right. So, um, we call this tolling the CSET. Um, so if the collection statute expiration date is, you know, five years away and the innocent spouse uh, case is open for four months, well, the collection statute expiration date will now become five years and four months plus an additional 60 days. So it becomes five years and six months. Okay. So, um, just like an offer and compromise a, uh, application or a, uh, a CDP appeal, um, innocent spouse requests are one of those things that extend the time, the statutory time period that the IRS has to collect on the liability. Now, a couple of quick things. Um, uh, that, that don't get talked about a whole lot. So I wanted to cover them. Um, there are situations where a, um, a spouse forges a signature on a tax return. Okay. We all know this happens. Um, you know, a lot of times it is in order to prevent the spouse from finding out about some sort of financial impropriety, um, cause they don't want to jeopardize the marriage. Right. Um, there are other situations where a tax return is signed under duress uh, and signatures that are made under duress, you know, courts have held that those signatures are, are invalid. Uh, and the thing to know here is that in these situations, the innocent spouse provisions of Internal Revenue Code Section 6015 don't actually apply uh, because the, the, the other spouse didn't actually sign the return with intent, okay? And so uh, the courts have held that, um, that you know, un, un, in, under duress or forgery situations, the, the tax return itself is invalid. And therefore, the joint liability was never actually created, okay? So what happens here is that the return itself is reversed and you're going to want to prepare a married filing separate return. Uh, and yes, uh, as um, uh, Lucia pointed out in chat, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to prove, especially with e-file. And this is very much an area of concern. Uh, this is definitely part of, um, it's one small part of the broader um, information security issues, the 
um, return fraud, return preparer fraud, um, identity theft. You know, it's 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 definitely um, um, uh, within that you know uh, arena of concern for the for the service and for taxpayers. Uh, so the thing to keep in mind here is that uh, these cases are still handled by uh, the Cincinnati um, Centralized Innocent Spouse Unit. Okay, so um, all correspondence, questions, etc., should all still be rela- uh, routed to Cincinnati, um, even though the Innocent Spouse rules technically don't apply. Uh, because the return itself becomes overturned, um, uh, but Cincinnati still handles these cases. Uh, another quick situation that you may encounter, uh, I've seen several of these in, in my career, uh, is where one spouse files an offer in compromise, uh, but didn't include the name and social security number of the other spouse. Uh, where I most commonly have seen this in my practice is in trust fund recovery penalty representation cases. Um, so what um, uh, can sometimes happen before, you know, before I pick up the case, before the client comes to me, um, they will have already filed an offer in compromise thinking it was the right thing to do because they had a, a trust fund recovery penalty that was already assessed. Um, And in case you didn't know this, yes, you can compromise trust fund obligations, okay? Um, So they'll file the OIC on the trust fund recovery penalty, um, the 6672 assessment. And then they'll go, oh, hey, I I owe X dollars in personal income tax liability also. So I'm just going to put that on the offer and compromise application as well but they only do it in their own name with their own social security number. Because if you read the, 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 uh, the instructions for, you know, filing it for trust fund recovery penalty, that's what it tells you to do. Okay. Um, and then, then they just check the box for the 1040 also, but they leave the other spouse off. Okay. And then if that offer and compromise gets approved, guess what? That spouse is now off the hook for the 1040 liability. But because it is a, quote unquote, joint and several liability, the other spouse is still on the hook. So there are two uh, solutions to this uh, situation. Uh, One is innocent spouse relief application. The other is for uh, the other spouse to file their own offer and compromise. Um, The... um, uh, the 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 faster way to do this is through the innocent spouse side, not the offering compromise side. Okay, um, the uh, much of the information, as you'll see on the form here in a minute, are are largely the same. Uh, but the process for innocent spouse relief is a lot faster. Okay, you don't have to wait around for six to twelve months waiting for an offer to be approved. So, um, in this kind of a situation, um, apply for innocent spouse relief and. Um, the, the argument to be made with innocent spouse relief is simply, well, the, my, my spouse was granted offer and compromise relief for the joint liability and we're in the same household. Therefore I should be granted innocent spouse relief for, uh, my liability on the obligation. Okay. That's the argument, argument you make. Um, and that's the argument that will, will win. Okay. So now let's talk about Form 8857. Uh, Form 8857 is the application for innocent spouse relief. And, you know, what you'll notice on this form is that um, it gets pretty personal. And and in fact, it starts to very quickly resemble a Form 433A. So as a practitioner, um, if you are in an 8857 situation and you already have a Form 433A, it becomes very easy to carry over a lot of that information and then review it with the client. It, it helps to accelerate the, the process. So basically, the form asks about the requesting spouse's involvement in the finances 
um, the tax preparation process, things like that, in order to determine whether they're eligible for relief and to what extent. Uh, keep in mind that um, it is not uncommon for partial relief to be granted. Okay, um, the, uh, the 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 service has discretion uh, in in how they determine relief, and as we'll see on the form, um, it gets pretty detailed, um, and they use that information uh, to determine how much relief to grant. It's not black and white. It's not zero or all. Um, it, 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 it is definitely a continuum. And here is my note to myself to switch to screen mode. So let me go ahead and do that. So hopefully on your screen, you now see the form go up here uh, request for innocent spouse relief so uh, some important things to consider um, uh, up here at the top it gives you the general warnings things we've already talked about uh, the bar and collections um, also uh, some to keep in mind the IRS is required by law to notify the person um, uh, on line five that you request this relief. So if there is a, uh, a separation or divorce situation, the IRS is going to notify the other spouse that you're applying for innocent spouse relief. Okay. So, um, you know, just be aware and make sure your client knows that that's going to happen. Um, however, they're, the, the IRS is prohibited from disclosing, um, uh, the requesting spouses, current name, address, phone number, or employer, okay? Um, and that is for, you know, uh, d uh, domestic violence uh, prevention, obviously. So let's go really quickly uh, through the form. Uh, so um, there's a description of the situations. The taxpayer or you uh, will indicate yes or no whether the situation applies. If so, continue. Um, uh, there's a, a quick uh, question to deter determine whether or not they should actually file form 8379 instead. Um, then I'll ask you about the tax years in question. I want to know your name, address, um, where you want to be contacted. They'll ask you for information about um, uh, the spouse uh, in the, uh, the requesting relief from uh, in regards to, you know, where they lived, et cetera. Um, for the tax years relevant, uh, relevant to the situation. Uh, and then here's where we get into the, the nitty gritty. Um, this is all going into the determination of, of whether you're eligible for relief, right? Um, they want to know when you were living together, when you were married, when you got divorced. Um, they want copies of divorce decrees. Um, they want to know what your level of education was. Now, remember, the, the purpose here is to allocate the tax liability, basically. So they're going to take into consideration your education level uh, of the requesting spouse, um, what they did, how much money they earned. Okay, those are considerations that the IRS uh, 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 contemplates when determining whether to grant relief. So they want to know education. They want to know if there was a domestic violence situation. And you can ask the IRS to consider this as part of their determination. Um, uh, mental and physical uh, problems, um, either at the time the return was filed or now. Uh, that is a consideration. I want to know how uh, the requesting spouse was involved with the finances and preparation of returns. Um, did you agree to file a joint return? Did you sign the joint return? Um, you know, this is where we get into the the signing under duress or or potential forgery issues, um, and that's where that's going to come up. Uh, part three, tell us if and how you were involved with finances and preparing those returns. 
Um, and most situations are going to fall into one of these check the box categories. Okay, you weren't involved. You had nothing to do with it. Um, you gathered stuff together. Um, you didn't know a joint return was filed. Okay, um, these are all things that they take into consideration. I'm not going to go through every single one of these. A lot of these were were um, uh, are, are self-explanatory for you when you're going through it. Plus, we're getting crunching on on, on time here. Uh, part three. Um, uh, tell us how you're involved in finances. Um, were, was the requesting spouse the money person in the family? Were there joint accounts? Um, were there any large expenses? Um, you know, trips, home improvement, uh, private schooling. Uh, these get into some of the collections financial standards uh, that we off, you know, that we refer to for Form 433A, that are disallowed expenses. Okay, so the IRS wants to know: you have a tax liability. Did you go do something else extravagant rather than pay your tax bill? Okay, did you take a two-month vacation to Hawaii? Um, did you send your children to private school? Okay, don't forget private school. Um, you know, uh, is, is a disallowed expense um, in the IRS collections process, okay? Um, did you buy uh, a Ferrari, you know, instead of paying your taxes? You know, they want to know that. Um, uh, transfer of assets. Uh, this is also a 433A question. If there was a transfer of assets and there was a federal tax lien, well, the, the asset transfer may be deemed inappropriate. They want to know what your current assets are, okay, and the fair market value. And again, very 433A-ish, right? Um, and this is almost straight out of the last page of 433A. Um, you know, they want to know about your income and your expenses. And don't for a second think that they're not going to compare this information to uh, the national standards, because they do, um, and it is part of their de determination, okay? If you're living a lavish lifestyle, and you're requesting innocent spouse relief, well, good luck with that. Um, you know, th this is, uh, that's, that's um, you know, why they're requesting this information. Um, uh, part five is the domestic violence situation. There are specific uh, provisions, especially related to, um, remember, 6015 uh, uh, paragraph F, uh, that allows the IRS discretion uh, for granting um, innocent spouse relief. And one of the big things that they take into account for that is domestic violence uh, experiences. Uh, for some clients, this can be a, um, a kind of a mentally taxing exercise to go through because guess what? The IRS wants copies of police reports, medical records, restraining orders, um, photos of injuries, okay? Um, and don't forget that some of this information is also protected and regulated um, by HIPAA, all right? So, um, you know, if you're handling this information, keep in mind that you have um, HIPAA privacy uh, rules that you're going to have to follow as well. Um, you know, so uh, the, the, the domestic violence uh, spousal abuse provisions is something the IRS takes pretty seriously, uh, so if this is the situation your client is, is in, um, and, and, um, you know, they, they have the mental fortitude to, to, to pursue this, um, you know, even though it opens up some, some, some bad memories and, 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 um, the, the non-requesting spouse gets notified, you know, from a financial perspective, you know, it may be worthwhile. So, you know, make sure you're, you're um, advising your, your clients on, you know, the financial benefit of doing this, even though it kind of opens up some, some bad memories here. So that is the gist of the form. Um, uh, keep in mind with a power of attorney, you can sign this yourself. Um, but do you remember it is signed under penalties of perjury, just like a form 433A.